What is going on everybody? Welcome to our first in our series called CTO TV. This is the first of a new series where we'll be taking a portion of the tech world, whether it be data, cloud computing, uh, AI, machine learning, and really just taking a moment and distilling down everything that's happened, whether it be in the past few weeks or months in this domain. There are hundreds of thousands of articles being posted weekly on Medium, Dev2, Business Insider, and so many other places that it can be hard to distill all this information and all that's important down into like just a 15 minute segment. Our goal is to take one section of the technical world and really just concisely break down everything that's kind of happened that we might find interesting, that you as a CTO or developer might find worthwhile knowing uh, so you can make better decisions, whether it be design decisions, third party products that you might consider buying, or new cloud technology that you might want to implement into your systems. So for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I just want to take a moment to discuss what is happening in the technical world. That way, whether you are a CTO, a developer, a director, a small business owner, or really anyone that's interested in what's going on, you can kind of get a good glimpse into all the changes, all the new things, all the new investments, and really just a general understanding of what's going on. For today's episode, I really wanted to focus on SQL and databases. This is for many reasons, one being, SQL and databases are my bread and butter. Uh, it's where I've started. It's what I still do a lot of work in, whether it be consulting um, or, or daily work. So I really enjoy working with these things and I really feel like I have a pretty decent understanding of everything that's going on and spend a lot of time figuring out what's new and what's changing. What I also find interesting about SQL is it's one of those hidden in-demand skills that I don't think everyone knows about. What I mean here is that a lot of people who come from a business background don't tend to learn about SQL in their day-to-day -day classes in college. However, it's often that these people are the ones that need it the most. It's similar to like Excel was in like the 1980s and 90s, SQL is becoming this very valuable tool. Oddly enough, SQL has been around since the 1970s and unlike many other languages and paradigms that have changed rapidly and come and gone, SQL's reign the same. You know, there's tons of tools that have tried to replace SQL, there's drag and drop tools, there's you know, various new query languages, but SQL is the one that I feel like has remained mostly the same, minus you know, changing and evolving with the times, unlike many programming languages that seem to disappear as fast as they're created. However, this isn't to say that SQL and databases haven't changed rapidly and a lot in general over the past 50 years. This is probably one of the reasons SQL has stuck around for as long as it has. It has evolved with the times in order to keep up with the demands, whether it be analytical or transactional, that businesses put on their databases. This specific episode will discuss some of these trends that are happening right now in the SQL world. We will be discussing how SQL in the last couple of years have become, has not only become more collaborative and ubiquitous, and the databases that really stand out are honestly the ones that are open source, not the classic Oracle and MSFSQL that really ended up running a lot of the world until somewhere in the around the early 2000s. With so much going on in the technical world, especially even in the SQL world, we hope that the next 10 or 15 minutes will be really helpful in condensing down everything that's going on and will really provide you some valid insights into the world of SQL. So one of the first points I wanted to cover is that SQL is just becoming more ubiquitous and more in demand than ever, in the sense that it's not only engineers that are using it anymore. Now everyone from analysts to product managers are really starting to see the value in understanding SQL and using it to analyze data that can then drive decisions. I've seen this in friends who work at FANG companies who maybe originally got some sort of finance degree and never learned any SQL in their undergrad, but then quickly, maybe they worked at Amazon, had to develop SQL skills in order to make data-driven decisions, uh, in order to provide their managers and directors with clear insights in order to support whatever position that they were taking. SQL has really become very similar to Excel in that way, in the sense that what used to be skills in Excel, now it's Excel plus SQL. You can't just be good at Excel because you need to somehow be able to get the data. And since most data engineers and software engineers are really busy building data sets, analysts and product managers are really often left to fend for themselves when they're trying to get all of these different data points. Most data engineers and BI developers don't have time to gather every ad hoc data request to provide at the rate that analysts and product managers need. Often, you know, analysts and product managers need the data the day of and right then and right now. This is usually not the, the pace that most BI, IT, data engineering teams work. And this is what's really pushed a lot of new tools in the collaborative SQL space. You can think very similar to uh, like a Google Sheets or a Figma in the sense that these tools are allowing multiple users to write queries and manage revisions. Tools like Popsicle, or you could maybe say Pop SQL or Pop SQL, has recently kind of come around as a very easy to use tool that allows you to write queries, collaborate, 
uh, and share that query with other people, as, as well as easily create charts with that query uh, without having to publish a Tableau or anything. And even from there, you can easily publish CSVs and push them out, whether it be to Slack or something similar, and really just get that collaborative environment going. So that way, even a product manager can come in, look at the SQL, look at the charts, and really get a good understanding of what's going on, whether it be from an analyst or a data engineer. That ability to kind of give self-service analytics is kind of this new goal. Um, and it's been a goal for a while, but how we approach it has constantly been changing and, and trying to find the right way where you can give analysts and product managers access to the data so they can answer their own questions has been a real fight. So this is where I think like tools like Popsicle um, and a few others are really trying to fill the gap. Some tools out there are taking a more complex approach where they're trying to use natural language processing to you know, detect what questions uh, and someone might be asking, you know, what is the average sale price of whatever region, you know, something similar to that, where what I just said in SQL is actually pretty obvious, you know, something there was average, so you say select average and group by some region, uh, filter by some region, whatever it might be. So that's, that's pretty straightforward, but sometimes queries become more complex. And this is where things like Popsicle might come into play because it allows your team to maybe work collaboratively to understand the business logic. Because I think this is usually the big case that, uh, this is usually the big area that a lot of people struggle with is the BI team does not necessarily understand uh, the business of whatever teams may be requesting data. And so there's all these nuances and, and little understandings that are hard to gain a grasp of. And so that's why this whole collaborative approach I think is a great method. In the end, these tools are really a great step in the whole self-service direction. I do think that we'll see either something like Popsicle or similar tools really start to take off because it, again, it gives more control to the people who need it. As we're going into a data-driven world, there will never be enough data engineers, BI, or IT teams to answer every ad hoc request. Uh, in order to answer every question, it just, it just can't happen. There's no way you could scale it. As someone who's been in that position, you can't scale every request. You'll, you might get in three or four requests in a day and to write that proper query, it often takes more than 30 minutes. Uh, oftentimes, if you want to make sure it's right, um, whatever the business logic is, whatever it might be, it usually takes a long time because data is never clean, data is never perfect, and there's always something wrong. But before I ramble on too long, let's go on to the next section. Where we're going to talk about open source. So for a long time, paid licensed databases were probably arguably the most popular databases to use, things like Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server. This is because they honestly performed really well. and a lot of people don't even know that Oracle ran and continues to run a lot of the world. A lot of your transactions, a lot of everything that happens in the world runs on Oracle. Even Amazon, for the longest period of time, ran on Oracle up until uh, supposedly Larry Ellison, the CEO of Oracle, kind of made a joke about how Amazon runs on Oracle and then supposedly, at least again, rumors say that uh, that's the day that Amazon decided they would no longer uh, rely on Oracle. But that's not where this section is going. What I want to talk about is open source. Open source databases have existed for a long time. Uh, MySQL definitely being one of the most popular. But there's another database that has definitely gained a lot of steam, which is Postgres. There's a company called EverSQL, which we're not going to go into the details about what it does. It's, it, it really has a lot to do with optimization of SQL, uh, some AI on rewriting SQL and things like that, but that's not the point of this. What's more interesting to me is that they have actually done um, a lot of research into what tools developers like. And what they found is that in 2018, uh, it, the most popular databases, at least from a developer standpoint, were MySQL, then MSSQL, and then Postgres. However, in 2020, this actually ends up switching to be MySQL Postgres, and then MSSQL, which MSSQL, for those who don't know, is Microsoft SQL Server. So what you can kind of tell here is that, you know, open source has become more popular. Uh, probably one of the reasons being that Postgres is a very popular option for people switching from Oracle um, to Postgres. One of the reasons being is, one, uh, these open source options have become just as powerful or just, you know, you can use them in certain methods, whether it's sharding, etc., that they can really operate the same as the paid license databases, but two, companies are making tons of money on them by running them as services. So for example, AWS has RDS, Relational Database Services. In that, you can run Postgres, you can run MySQL, and several other database systems where you will be charged, but not for the software, just the usage. This new model has made Amazon tons of money, and then the only software they had to make was the management software. So they're basically getting paid from the management of MySQL and Postgres, not the actual software itself. It's kind of, kind of a brilliant plan. These two databases were never really developed for the cloud in the first place. These two databases came about when things were on premise. So what about open source cloud? 
there's actually probably a lesser known database option. It's called Yugabyte DB. Yugabyte is actually a more recent up and comer. Um, and it's, the goal of Yugabyte is really to solve supposedly all the problems of both NoSQL and SQL databases. Okay, not all of the problems, but many of the big ones in the sense that their goal is to create a database that has all the benefits of you know NoSQL and all the benefits of a SQL database. So it's ASCII compliant, meaning you know you have consistency, you know that your data is not gonna leak or just or get dropped off somewhere, while also automatically sharding, automatically load balancing, and all these other benefits um, that some NoSQL databases have. Yogabyte's actually been around for a little bit. Uh, it wasn't until 2019 that they became open source, so that means they were actually around a little bit prior to that. But this month, they actually ended up getting $30 million more worth of funding uh, spread across a couple of funds, specifically one of the bigger ones being WePro, and WePro is really pushing it on their clients. So this is kind of an interesting point because we didn't see Yugabyte on EverSQL's survey, but maybe we'll see it in the next few years. Again, this is still a new system. Honestly, all the promises that they're making, we've heard before, and we're, we are curious to see you know, if Yugabyte can deliver. Um, if they can, we probably will in the next three to five years see a lot more companies use them or some other company will try to replicate what they're doing and you know replace them. But whichever way, you'll end up having a system that is a more complete database than we've ever really had before. But Yugabyte is not the only distributed database system that is getting more funding. But in this case, what I'm gonna be referring to is more of a data warehouse database system versus more of something that currently is being aimed towards applications. Some of you might not know what data warehouses are, but data warehouses really drive a lot of the analytical part of companies. They're what people develop dashboards upon, metrics, etc. It's the classic OLTP versus OLAP, online transaction processing versus online analytical processing. These are two very different schools of thought in the sense that both the database systems that typically run them and the way you build that database are actually slightly different because they're trying to do different tasks. Transactions deal with transactions, so you purchasing products, you going to an event, you going to a website and clicking something. These are all kind of transactions. They're a single line typically inserting into a database or updating somewhere in the database. Whereas analytical databases are tending to be more focused on running over billions of rows, some sort of aggregation or, or calculation. So these two problems need very different solutions. One of the tools that has recently come about is Starburst. It was reported this month that Starburst got $42 million in additional funding. Um, but what is Starburst, unlike a lot of other uh, systems, is actually a riff off of Presto in the sense that they took Presto. Uh, and for those who don't know Presto, what Presto is, it's basically a SQL engine developed by Facebook uh, to sit on top of pretty much almost anything or any database. So you could have it sitting on top of like MySQL, Teradata, or multiple other systems and kind of bring all that data together and analyze it. However, there is a major problem and that is that Postgres in itself is not enterprise ready. And what do we mean by that? So enterprises need a lot of things like access control, security, and a lot of database connectors to connect to all the various databases. Presto in itself only has some of these things and many of these things are incomplete. So that's where Starburst has kind of stepped in and tried to develop a lot of other features, everything from an admin portal, uh, access control, security, et cetera, to really provide the value that enterprises need. And this allows companies to take advantage of similar technologies that large tech companies like Amazon and Google have without the complications of managing it themselves. Not a lot of non-tech companies have giant armies of engineers that they can throw at problems. You know, healthcare is one of those great examples where they don't have a limitless supply of engineers. They only have so many, and most of them are generally focused on day-to-day -day work. And having to manage a totally new piece of software requires way too much investment. So developing management services like Starburst uh, can help get them to analyze their data just as easily without having the cost of having to develop things custom. So what Starburst is really trying to do is create a path where large companies that aren't necessarily technical can have all of these same advantages. With that, it really just goes to show that SQL remains the language of data. So what we want to ask you guys is, how is your team taking advantage of your data today? Databases in SQL are not going anywhere. If anything, over the last few minutes, I've kind of discussed how SQL is just becoming more prolific. Again, it's becoming more collaborative. There are more companies coming around trying to create layers of SQL on top of 
you know, NoSQL databases um, and just about every other piece of data that there is in your company. I've personally worked with companies that are, you know, small business owners that are using things like Tableau and, you know, SQL databases on a daily basis. Even though, you know, they're only a seven figure company, they themselves know that every decision that they make can be amplified and can be more impactful if they actually know what's going on with their customers. So we really do love seeing tools like Popsicle and Starburst that really provide this new ability to take advantage of your data without necessarily having all of the heavy costs of developing these custom systems yourself. And with that, we wanted to close our first episode of CTO TV. We hope that this has been kind of an interesting summary of what's kind of gone on in the world of SQL in the last two weeks. You know, we didn't cover everything from like 2019 or even in 2020. We really kind of just focused on some things that we've seen um, in the last three to four weeks we hope that this was interesting. We hope to make more of these videos. Please do take some time to either comment, like, and subscribe. Uh, we want to make this better for you guys. We want to provide more information. We kind of want this to almost be like a video version of a, of a market report you might read or something similar. So we're going to hopefully even build more in-depth research pieces where you, we really cover a lot of what's going on. Um, and we need your help just to, just to make these things better. Um, eventually, I'll probably get a microphone. Eventually, I'll try to make this really stand out, but I really kind of wanted just to put out this first episode, get a good feel from you guys, hear what you guys think, hear what you guys want to hear about, like are there specific topics that you'd like to hear about, whether it be cloud technology, um, etc. We really are trying to make this for you guys. So thank you so much for listening and we hope to see you next time on CTO TV. Bye.